Good morning, Year 10. This is Revision Lesson 2. as the second quiz. And actually, what this will do is highlight that the level of detail that you need to try and remember for this GCSE Computer Science exam might surprise you. I think a lot of you have got good math skills, you've got good computer programming skills, but you might find that you've only skimmed through the written content for the course. And when I've set tasks, some of you have done the main questions, but none of the extension work. And I think um, it could be difficult in the exam if you don't have the level of detail required. If I'm talking primarily uh, for this quiz about pages 207 to 210 in your textbook, um, the chapter about the environment, e-waste, uh, there is raw materials and hazardous chemicals inside uh, tech equipment, computer equipment. We have to assume uh, that the people that wrote the uh, textbook are the same people who wrote the exam. And so anything on those pages of that book could be examined and tested in some way. And one of the problems with this course is that the, um, the exam's relatively new. There's only a couple of years of past papers. Uh, so it's difficult to know exactly how they will test the content from the textbook. So my advice would be to read it and actually pay attention to the fine details on the page and try and memorize um, as much of it as you can. And that way, at least you're in a position to talk about the facts uh, that are presented to you. And as I've said, it's pages 207 onwards. Uh, up to the end of uh, the bit to do with raw materials and hazardous chemicals. Let's start the quiz then. It's the same as last time. Have a look. I want you to copy, there's 20 questions, I want you to copy down the title, there's a little typo here, I've just re reused the previous document, it's revision lesson two. Copy the question number down and then A, B, C or D as your final answer and then pause the video once you've heard me asking the question, uh, of course, and then you can write your answer down and then press play and mark it, uh, change it if it's gone wrong. If you've written the wrong letter, you can just cross it out and put the correct one. And count your ticks at the end, give yourself a score out of 20. Let's get started then. And as I've said, it is quite wordy. This, uh, you'll find everything you need in that textbook. And if there's anything in that book that you you see that's unfamiliar, you could always Google that concept or that organization and then find a little bit uh, more about what they do, which is some, uh, I've done some of that in order to make this, this quiz. If, if I've found something uh, on the page of the book, and I thought, oh, I've not heard of that organisation before. I then quickly looked them up and at least I've got a bit more detail than just the you know sentence that's on the page. Let's start then, question one. Starts nice and simple. Question one, what is e-waste? Is it the contents of your recycle bin on Windows 10? You can empty this bin, um, get rid of the files, or you can get your old files back, uh, undelete them, as it were, by taking them out of the, the recycle bin. Is that e-waste? Or is it B? Any form of discarded electronic equipment? Is it C, recycled computer products that are repurposed into new technology to help save the environment? Or is it none of the above? Well, just like last time, if you pause it, then I'll do the answer in a minute. Now, the answer to this one, let's have a look, there's a red herring here. C, C, sounds plausible. Recycled computer products that are repurposed that is part of this chapter, the idea that that is a thing. And there are organizations out there that try and encourage companies to, uh, to harvest the uh, precious metals that are inside old technology and repurpose them. So that is actually a thing, but it's not the answer to this question. This question says, what is e-waste? And e-waste is this one here, any form of old electronic equipment. You might think to yourself, well, is this that much of it? Yeah, it is, there's tons and tons of it thousands of millions of old devices just just piled up and uh, it, it is becoming a problem that we need to deal with as a society and this one is a bit silly e-waste is it the contents of your recycle bin you do have a little bin on your desktop and you can delete files and undelete them or empty bin and clear up space on your hard drive so technically that is waste wasted files that are electronic so you might think it's that but of course it's not question two What's the approximate lifespan um, of a modern mobile phone? And by this, 
I don't mean how long does it last before it you know, it, it breaks and it no longer functions. I mean how long before the person that's, that owns it has, has got bored of it and has moved on to a new technology. Is it A, two years, B, five years, C, six months, or D, none of the above? Pause it. Right, the answer to this one, let's have a look. It is two years roughly for a mobile phone to lose its its edge in terms of people wanting to go out and buy a new one. And that is a problem. If you think about the expense, uh, the raw materials to, to make the product, the, the millions spent designing it, and then the, you know, the fact that it isn't broken, it's just no longer wanted and it, they just get thrown away. So two years. If we compare that, you know, I'm older than you, if we compare this to when I was a, a child, primary school age, and there's no such thing as mobile phones and people had a house phone and it was plugged into the wall in your house and it, it was the same phone for the whole of your childhood. You know, people weren't out upgrading their phone. They're very rare if for anybody to do that. And so it's, the world has changed. It seems perfectly normal for people to want a new phone every two minutes, it seems. And that is producing all of that e-waste that we talked about in question one. And we'll talk in a minute about why that's a problem. Question three. Name a negative environmental or social impact of all the technology that we see around us. A, damage to nature and local environment during the extraction of raw materials. So is that a problem? B, the people working on the gathering of those raw materials are hurt or killed as the job can be dangerous. Uh, and despite that, it's often a low paid job. C, piles and piles of e-waste containing harmful chemicals and materials that cause issues. This e-rubbish sits around and slowly decays, causing problems. Or is it D? All of those things. Pause it. Now the answer to this one. Obvious, I think. All of them. Let's have a look. When you are digging up the raw materials, you know, the copper for all the wiring, etc., there's chemicals that you have to um, extract from the ground that, that are used for a variety of purposes. Uh, when you when you're actually collecting these materials, it ruins the earth. You can you know, huge open cast mines to get you know, dig deeper and deeper to get to these uh, finite materials. They will eventually run out, so we're damaging uh, local natural habitats uh, during this process. The actual process of gathering those materials and in some cases working with those materials in the factories to make the devices is dangerous and can often lead to health issues for either people. Uh, literally working on that or that live in the local area uh, due to the chemicals uh, leaking into rivers or um, the smoke and uh, gases that are produced by these factories and extraction plants can be very unpleasant to live nearby. Uh, and then we've talked about this already, there's just there's millions of gadgets just sat rusting and leaking chemicals into the, into the ground and so on. So, so that's also a problem. On to question four. Which of the following harmful chemicals are used regularly in the manufacture of computer products? I think if you look on page 208, somewhere around there in your textbook, you'll find information about, about the six hazardous substances that you need to learn about. And I'm just saying to you, have you looked at that list recently? Do you understand that you might be asked about it? So which of the following harmful, in quotes, chemicals are used regularly? So is it A, sand, B, various metals such as copper, C, arsenic, cadmium, and chromium, or D, all of them. Pause it, and we'll have a look at the answer. Now, the answer to this one, you could be caught out by just thinking, well, I think some of these are used in computing. For example, uh, copper is used to make wiring. You might think, well, that, that's in a computer. These might be, I don't know, they sound harmful. And then sand. I think it's just some sand in a computer, but sand can be manufactured into glass or part of the process. It involves sand. Uh, so they're all actually in, in computers, all these things. But the important point is it's, it's harmful, and sand isn't harmful, and it's natural form copper isn't harmful either particularly. So we've got, it's this one down here. So that's the answer. Uh, arsenic, cadmium, and chromium. Arsenic is a good conductor found in circuit boards. So... The, these companies will use anything they can get their hands on, harmful or otherwise, to improve the function of their products. 
computing products are all about the conduction of electricity on tiny little circuits. And if you can improve that conductor, you may be able to improve the speed of the technology. And uh, the consumer wants that. You know, everybody, um, the vast majority of people would say, oh, I'm getting an iPhone 12. It's faster than the iPhone 11. And uh, it totally disregard the process that went into making it. You know, very few people say it's, it's got too much arsenic in it. I'm, I'm sticking with my iPhone 11. We're consumers and people tend to completely disregard or not know anything about the damage to the environment uh, that's being caused by their, their, their tech that they carry around with. On to question five. How could e-waste cause an issue for wild animals? A, uh, a wild animal could find an old iPhone and choke on it. B, the poisonous materials included in some ra uh, radioactive elements can leach into the ground or leak into the ground, causing health issues for animals and, and the natural environment. C, the Wi-Fi signals given off by tech uh, may be linked to radiation poisoning uh, some animals, or is it all of them? Was it? Have a think about it. Now, the answer to this one, I mean, A is a bit silly. You know, the idea that uh, an animal might you know, stumble across an old iPhone lying around and, and, and joke on it. It's, it's not that. <laughs> um, and this one as well is meant to like make you think about something you might already in the news about the fact that people say, you know, mobile phones are possibly causing radiation, might damage you in some way. We don't really know. Maybe we'll look back on it in 50 years and like people look back on cigarettes when they first appeared, people smoked and didn't care. Now people know that the risks involved. Maybe we'll be the generation of people that used mobile phones right next to our face and then we look back and realise we probably shouldn't. There's no firm evidence on this at this point, but it's certainly not to do with damaging animals. Anyway, you don't see animals on their mobile phones. So this this is a, to, just to try and catch you out, is actually B. There are some radioactive elements used inside tech products. And when they are thrown into a pile and not dealt with properly in terms of disposal, that does cause local problems for that environment. Question six, tech products are made right where the raw materials are extracted. So I'm talking here about the location of the factory. Are tech products made right next to where the mine is, where the copper mine, for example? Let's have a look at these answers. Yes, materials such as copper are mined from the earth and then the factory is right next door to save on transport costs. Or is it B, often the factory is as close as it can be to the raw materials uh, extraction point in the mine. C, the raw materials travel thousands of miles across the world to get to factories where devices are made or none of them. Which one of those do you think is right? Let's look at the answer to this one. I hope common sense, thinking about the damage to the environment would lead you to realize it's actually C. You can't just build your iPhone factory next to a copper mine. It doesn't work like that. For a start, there are thousands of components in an iPhone and the mines and extraction points are all all over the world. So it would be logistically very difficult to try and achieve that. So what they do instead is gather all the materials from wherever they are. And if they need to ship them thousands and thousands of miles or, you know, on, on an airplane that is polluting as it burns fossil fuels in order to, uh, to fly, uh, it's irrelevant as long as that tech gets made and people spend money on it. Unfortunately, some of these companies are very uh, disinterested in the environmental impact. So see, uh, unfortunately, these, these materials move a very long distance, damaging the environment in the process. Question seven. Name an environmental issue associated with te the technological revolution or part of the technology revolution. So name an environmental issue. A, raw materials are transported thousands of miles before being made into components. This causes pollution. Sounds familiar. I think we just talked about that. B, once made, the devices are then shipped thousands of miles again to be delivered to shops and the end customer. C, manufacturing tech products is relatively energy intensive. Large amounts of non-renewable fossil fuels, etc., are used to make the tech that is all around us. Or is it D, none of those things? Now, it can't be none of them. We've just talked about A. So I think about your answer and decide which of them you think are true, which answer you want to pick. Let's have a look at this one then. 
Now, I did say on the last quiz, I don't know if I mentioned it at the start of this one, sometimes to try and catch you out, more than one answer is true, and it's, uh, it's those three. We've talked about in the previous question that raw materials do not live right near the factory, so you've got to um, gather them, take them wherever you need to to make the products, so that's a problem. Once the device is made, so I assume we've made it, it at then point B, it then takes talks about the next leg of the journey for the device. It then travels thousands and thousands of miles all around the world again um, to go to the people uh, that actually end up with a product in their hand. So those two things have a major impact in terms of the environmental damage. Uh, and then C, the actual act of making the device once the materials are, uh, have been mined involves lots of non-renewable fuels as well. So I'm talking about coal, oil, gas being used in massive quantity in order to to make the tech that is all around us. And that's a problem as well. You can see this is, this is something that we've created for ourselves due to the technology that we want to use. We seem hungry for the technology, but um, not too interested in the, the long-term negative impact on the planet. Question um, eight, let's move along. Which of these facts about hazardous materials are true? Now I've put facts in quotes because some of these are fake. Let's have a look. A, is cadmium used for printer ink? B, mercury is used to make computers run fast. Uh, C, toxic compounds are added to tech products to make them fire retardant, or is it none of these things? Pause it, have a look at it, write your answer down and then we'll, we'll talk about this. Okay, so there's more than one answer here again. Let's uh, see what they are. Now, first of all, the wrong answers. Mercury is harmful but it's not used to make computers run faster. It's certainly not mentioned in the textbook as being used in that way. There may be some applications of mercury inside tech products uh, that help it function, but it's certainly not just outright, let's put some mercury in, it'll run quick. Uh, so that was, I just made that up. Let's have a look at this one. This is one of the six controlled uh, products, or raw materials that is harmful that you need to uh, read a little bit about. It's in the textbook. So at least you know what they they're for. Cadmium is used in, in a variety of, uh, of processes, but it's one of them is to make printer ink. And then C, this one's weird. You get why, I mean, you would want all these tech products, computer cases, you know, all, all the hardware you see around you, you'd want them to be fire retardant by that. If they do catch fire, you want them to um, either not burn very well or, or not catch fire very easily and it prevents people from being killed in house fires that would spread and you might think well does everything burn really easily and the answer to that is quite often a product will burn very easily and spread very quickly and, and um, what they do is they add anything they can to the product to make it not catch fire properly and often the things they add are toxic and uh, again it, it's, it becomes irrelevant sometimes to the manufacturer they just want it to not burn and uh, if they need to put something unpleasant in there to achieve that, then they do. So that's the answer to that. And again, this is all found in the textbook if you read it. Uh, sometimes it's just a sentence, a throwaway sentence about one of these points I've made. But as I said right at the beginning of this quiz, we don't know exactly how they will examine this. So I'm just thinking, let's learn what's in the book. Question nine. What does ROHS stand for? It's an acronym. Is it A, the reuse of hazardous substances? Talked about that right at the start of this quiz. Is it B, the restriction of hazardous substances? Is it C, the right of hazardous statements? Or is it D, none of these? Pause it. A, I think A and B sound the most plausible. I just made C up completely. It's B, the restriction of hazardous substances. Now, the reason I wrote A down is because there is a question later on in this quiz and some content in your textbook about reusing hazardous or rare or valuable minerals that are inside old computers to try and reharvest those components and, and put them, you know, to repurpose them into new tech. I was trying to get that in here, but actually the ROHS is um, a set of standards or an organization that's all about trying to prevent the use of these hazardous substances in the first place, rather than once they've been used uh, trying to get them um, back again and reuse reuse them. It's more about saying let's not use them in the first place. So that's what that's about. ROHS. You see it written on products sometimes. Uh, ROHS with a lowercase O standing for of. 
Question 10. <clears throat> I've just told you what they do. What does our RHS do? Let's have a look. A. They hunt down people that are polluting our rivers with e-waste and bring them to justice. B. Do they keep a list of current computer products and how they are manufactured? This allows them to make sure that all hazardous materials are handled with care and this increases worker safety. So that's accidents in the workplace. C. Restricts how the six hazardous materials are used and forces companies to find safer materials instead. Or is it all of them? Pause it. Have a think about it. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we'll do the answer now. Now, I deliberately made up some information on this page. There's one answer that's in the textbook and that is true. The other two sound sort of fairly plausible or linked with what they do. First of all, we'll do the right answer. RHS, the restriction of hazardous substances, is actually C, restricts how those materials can be used in manufacturing and tries to encourage the uh, force, is a better word, tries to make people uh, use safer alternatives instead. A, do they hunt people down? They're not a police force. They don't, they're not envir environmental warriors running about, you know, taking people down that are getting breaking rules. That's not that's not what it's about. So that's wrong. And this one here, yeah, it sounds plausible. They keep a list of computer products and they probably do have a list of, of how these things are used, but this allows them to make sure that they're handled, these materials are handled with care. It's not that. Um, safety at work is important. But the ROHS is about not using the products in the first place as opposed to using them safely. On to question 11. Which of these are part of, in quotes, the six materials that we're supposed to learn about in GCSE computer science? So it's a memory job. It's just see if you can read the page and try and get it stuck in, in, your, in your head. Um, the chemicals are, are elements that are in tech products and what they are for, what they're used for. Let's have a look. Is it A, hexavalent chromium, B, lead, C, strong acids, or D, all of them? So there may be more than one answer here. Let's have a look at the answer. It's actually these two here, and there's a page in your book with the six in quotes. I made up C, strong acids. It sounds plausible. You, do, you probably do use strong acids um, um, in the manufacture of certain electronic components and circuit boards and things, but... Um, that's not a controlled substance in terms of ROHS. Part of the six are hexavalent chromium and lead, and there are four others for you to read about as well if you read the textbook. Which uses more energy? Now, this is in the book. All of the things that I'm talking about, I've just taken straight from the pages of the book, pages 207 to 210. Let's have a look. Some of it's made up, some of it's true. Let's see what, see what the right answer is. Which uses more energy? Let's have a look. Is it is it A, the manufacture and distribution of text? I'm talking about raw material extraction, the factory that does the actual building of the devices and the distribution, which we've said the travel thousands of miles. Or is it B, the actual end use of the tech itself? Is that more energy hungry? Or is it C, they're the same? Or is it D, it depends on what technology you're talking about? Pause it. Let's have a look at the answer. It is surprising this. I didn't know this till I read the book. It's the use of the tech that uses more energy. Apparently, a substantial amount more. There's billions of technical devices, computers, laptops, uh, tablets, mobile phones. That not just that, the little display on the front of your fridge, the uh, Hive central heating liquid crystal display. I've got a smart meter in front of me here that's got a little display on it. All these things, little tech devices and they just use an absolutely ludicrous amount of energy to, to run. And uh, it far outweighs the actual huge amount of energy already that's used to, to dig the materials up and to make the tech and to distribute the tech. It's actually the use of them that's uh, the main problem. So they're not the same. On to question 13. Remember, there's 20 questions. Let's get through this. Question 13. Name a particularly power-hungry computing application. Now, you might think to yourself, um, by computing application, I mean software. You might think to yourself, what difference does it make? Um, what software is running on uh, on a, a PC or on a phone? Surely it's just the power to, to, to make the thing switch on that we are talking about in this topic. But actually, it does matter what it's doing. Some things sat, uh, use more, more energy than others. So let's have a look at our choices. Is it A, 3D video gaming, B, word processing, 
as in making a document and printing it out, is it C, sending emails? That's obviously a lot of people doing that right now. Or is it some something to do with complex maths and some calculations? Which of those do you think is particularly uh, uses a lot of power? The answer to this one, let's have a look. It's actually, this, those two are the same thing, basically. And it reminds me of a comment I told you right at the start of the course where a boy that I taught in year nine once said, um, as if there's any maths in a computer game. And he was being deadly serious. He was being rude about maths, I think. Oh, you know, maths is boring. Uh, you couldn't use maths to make a game. You know, it's outrageous, of course. It's it's all maths. And and this is this question highlights this. Uh, two, two facts. First of all, you know, 3D gaming and complex calculations are pretty much the same thing. That's how the uh, the game knows exactly what to draw where, uh, including the physics model of how things would react when they bump into each other and so on. It's incredibly complex math mathematical calculations. So that means that the gaming fits inside the, the category of complex calculations. And anything complex is very power hungry. Uh, and so your phone, when playing a game, is probably going to use more power, use your battery more quickly and so on. Just simple word documents, sending an email, making a phone call, basic things like that are not as bad. It's, it's applications that really push the hardware, that really use the power. On to question 14. What would a data center, uh, or why would a data center consume lots of power? A data center, you should have read about them. There's a thing about um, big data in the, in the book, chapter six, we've, we've done some work on that although it's not mentioned in great detail in the uh, the book itself. It, there's a little, maybe half a page on it. <clears throat> Let's have a look. Why are they using lots of power? A, they need to keep their staff nice and warm, so they heat the place up to 25 degrees or more sometimes. Happy workers do a better job. Is it B, the computers would break without constant power, sapping cooling fans with lots of um, money used to cool all the equipment down? Is it C, to store and process that amount of data means you need thousands of power hungry servers or is it all of them? Let's do the answer to this one. Two answers. First of all, the, the silly one. You don't warm up a data center to keep people happy. It's just, I just thought, what, what a silly answer could I make up there? That's just not, I mean, there'll be a minimum working temperature that people will be happy, but actually, You'll, we'll see from these answers here that they probably don't need to warm it up at all because a data center produces an absolutely ridiculous amount of heat. And the main problem is trying to get rid of that heat so the computers don't break. So actually, I'm sure done properly, a big company would use that heat and repurpose it, possibly use it to uh, heat the uh, the working environment itself and the, the machines will be somewhere else. So let's have a look at B. The computers break without constant cooling funds. A ridiculous amount of cooling is needed to... to keep a server cool. And if you look at a data center for someone like Amazon or Google, these buildings are huge and, and the amount of heat they would produce, the computers would break instantly if they didn't have very carefully controlled cooling processes that cool the whole building. <clears throat> so that uses a lot of power. And then the actual size of these data centers, that's what C is about. There are thousands and thousands of machines all stacked up on top of each other in racks with air conditioning blasting at them to keep it all nice and cool. And just the sheer amount of computing that's there uses a lot of power. On to question 15. Who's the worst? Who's the enemy when it comes to the environment then? Is it A, the big players, the big boys such as Apple, Google, Microsoft? Are they, are they the problem? Is it the government? It's always the government. Probably the government. Is it C, small, the, small, the little man, small private companies? Surely not. Now they're doing their bit with the environment, it can't be them. Or is it Netflix? Oh, Netflix, is it them? Are they? Imagine they have a massive data server uh, farm somewhere for all the film streaming that they're doing. Uh, are, they, are, they, are they the bad guys? So who's the worst? Have a think about it. Right, now the answer to this one, I would have picked A for that one before I read the book. It isn't A, and there's a reason why it isn't A. Any big company is made by the pressure of the internet, all the people on there that basically say bad things about them if they do the tiniest thing wrong. They're made to behave themselves. They've got no choice. A good example of this, uh, if we move away from tech briefly, is, is McDonald's. McDonald's were 
at one point famous for having terrible stuff inside their burgers. They would just shove any old thing in there and sell it cheap. And they got in so much limelight and, and into trouble in the media that they cleaned up their act completely oh, about 15 years ago. And, um, you know, our burgers are just are just beef and nothing else. You know, it's their advertising slogan. And, and actually, they're able to um, produce food. Still has a bad reputation, but it's actually not full of additives and nasty things. Uh, and if they do it any other way, people pay attention to them and tell them off. Whereas a small little takeaway burger shop, put anything they want in there, nobody would even notice. And that's what's happening here. The link with what I've just said in tech is that actually small private data companies that have a data center of their own sort of are anonymous and can have a ridiculously inefficient systems in place that are ruining the environment. And nobody even knows who they are. So the big players are probably doing it right, as right as you can if you're going to offer that service. Because it's the little ones that are a problem. And in amongst that, government departments that are not monitored and not known about also cause issues for the environment. They're not well-known companies. They're not monitored in the same way. They might be above the regulations and just do what they want because they're the government. So actually, it's the little man that's... And there's lots of companies all around the world that are small, that are not doing it right. And as I've said, I'm not necessarily saying that Apple and Google, Microsoft, Netflix, or whoever, are, are, are perfect. But they certainly are watched so closely that they have to behave themselves and be very envi environmentally friendly compared to uh, small companies that are more secret about what they do. <clears throat> right, on to question 16. I'm getting through this now. I've got five questions left. What's a special name? For the amount of carbon dioxide an organization produces, you'll see this on the news all the time. Is it A, the CO2 index? Is it B, the ROHS scale? Is it C, so that's B, is it C, the Beaufort, the Beaufort scale? Or is it D, the carbon footprint? Was it? Now, the answer to this one, I just made them up. Apart from, apart from my CO2 index rating, don't know what that is, never heard of it. This one here is fake. I just thought it sounded plausible. Beaufort scales to do with how fast uh, the speed of wind. It's got nothing to do with computers. Um, it's carbon footprint. This little typo. Um, there. <clears throat> when it comes on, it says none of these. It's carbon footprint. And that's just the name of how much carbon dioxide an organization produces. And if we go back a question, the carbon footprint of Apple, Google, and Microsoft will be huge. But they'll have reduced it quite publicly under the watchful gaze of millions or possibly even billions of people on the internet looking and, and criticizing every single thing they do. And they have, they have no choice but to try and improve their carbon footprint and use less, uh, produce less CO2. Whereas a small private company anonymously does what they want and per, per person, a small company would probably be worse than some of these big players, which is surprising to me. I would have said the big players were probably worse. <clears throat> so it's carbon footprint. Question uh, 17. This is just a silly fact that I found in the textbook. I can't imagine this being in your exam, but let's have a look at it. Roughly, how much does all of the waste in the world currently weigh? Does it weigh as much as the Titanic? B, as much as a lot of elephants? C, around the same as 11 Egyptian pyramids? Or D, nobody could possibly measure that. No one knows. Let's have a look at the answer to this one. Uh, it's, as I said, it's, you're not going to be asked this in a GCSE exam, but sometimes just interesting though, the amount we're talking about. And if you've not been to Egypt, the pyramids are absolutely huge. And the idea that around the world, there are devices that if you were to stack them up, would weigh the same as 11 Egyptian pyramids is just outrageous. So it's, it's this one here. And if we talk about the, you can't know, how would you know? It's impossible. People do say that sometimes because you can't literally weigh each old device and add it all together. And there's a technique called Fermi estimation that we've mentioned, Fermi, F-E-R-M-I, Fermi estimation. I mentioned it in a starter in one of my lessons uh, months ago. And that's where you roughly estimate using some assumptions how much of something there is. So it is actually possible, and it's fairly accurate, surprisingly accurate. Um, <clears throat> and so you can roughly work out how much there is. That's the sort of calculation they do to work out how much plastic there is floating in the ocean, that sort of thing. You don't sail around counting it. Um, all right, question 
17, there you go. So it's, uh, there's a lot of it, basically. Question 18. This is about the change. Is the amount of e-waste increasing by the same amount each year? So let's have a look at the answers. Yes, we consume products at the same rate each year. The increase is linear. By that, I mean, if you drew it on a graph over time, it would be a straight line with a ruler, linear. B, no. It appears to be exponential. It went up by a third in just the last five years. C, it doubles every year. Or D, how could you possibly know that? Nobody knows. Let's have a look at the answer to this one. It's not linear. It actually increases on a curve and it's and it's ex accelerating and getting away from us. Uh, if you were to put it, I don't know, if you were to exaggerate this and go back, let's say 70 years, and then think how much extra tech uh, uh, and e-waste were we creating 69 years ago or 68 years ago? There was hardly any. Uh, and, and, it, and it probably wasn't increasing much at all. But if you just look in the last couple of years, the amount of e-waste we're producing as people all upgrade their phones, kettles, toasters, and lives with every single gadget you could ever imagine, the, the, the amount of waste is, is increasing at a ridiculous rate. And uh, if it's a problem now, imagine how much of a problem it's going to be in 10 years, basically. It's, it's, getting, it's getting away from us. Question 19. How much gold is there? in a million old mobile phones piled up. Again, you're not going to be asked this as an exact fact, but you might be asked to comment about e-waste and the, the contents of, of this, this rotting pile of electronics and you know what why it's a problem, why it's there, and what's in, in it that we might want. Some of the things inside this e-waste is actually valuable. So inside a million old phones is there, A, 24 kilograms of gold, B, none, it's e-waste. The name suggests there is no value to it, it's waste. C, 24 grams, or D, nobody could possibly measure that, no one knows. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the answer to this. It is a surprising 24 kilograms of gold, and if you were, uh, you know, pick up something that weighs 24 kilograms, it's, it, you'd know about it, and uh, it, there's a lot of value in 24 kilograms of gold. So when these companies say, well, buy your old mobile phones, you see adverts on TV sometimes, some of it is to harvest the precious metals inside on the circuit boards and you might think why why am why have i got gold inside my phone but it's a good conductor it's used for audio connections and things to give improved clarity of sound and a variety of other uses inside there and it's just sat there so you can't just dig a big hole throw all the tech inside it cover it over which they do <laughs> but you're better off actually trying to get back at the, at the you know the, these these materials and trying to get them back and, and reuse them Last question we got there. What do the WEEE -E -E regulations do? Now, it sounds like something to do with wrestling, but uh, it's not. A, restrict how many hazardous materials you can use in a tech product. That sounds familiar. We've, we've talked about that. B, set targets for the collection, recycling, and recovery of computer technology. <clears throat> C, harvest all the gold. Are they the people getting all the gold out of the, these mountains of e-waste? Or D, are they buying all your old tech and phones for a good price so they can then recover the gold and precious metals? So what are the WEE regulations all related to? Let's have a look at the answer to this one. It's from the textbook. It's not ROHS, so it's not A. Let's have a look at that. It's not A. And they're not, regulations, regulations are nothing to do with harvesting uh, of products or or buying old phones, what they had to do with it are regulations that oversee that companies themselves should recycle these things. So it's about trying to force companies to actually recover the useful elements inside e waste. A set of regulations, the waste electrical and electronic equipment regulations, they sound like a fun set of regulations. I've got that document's thrilling to read, but it irrelevant of how dull that might sound. If you can collect all the, all all this waste and process it in such a way that we can reuse what's there, uh, you can help the environment um, by not um, having to throw as much away. But also, the, the I've mentioned this word already: the, the materials we're talking about are finite; they will run out eventually. And if we've got piles and piles of them lying around, we need to reuse what we've got already. That's it. Give yourself a score <clears throat> out of twenty. Let's see how you did. Same as last time, 
well done if you've got 20. I don't think I would have got 20 on that quiz uh, unless I'd just read the book. And that highlights how important it will be for you to read that book regularly. Uh, that chapter six should become very familiar to you by the time we do this exam. And you, you don't get that from a classroom with me. I'm not going to stand and talk about this over and over. I'm there to teach you to program uh, and to point you in the right direction. So you'll have to learn a lot of this yourself. Uh, for, that's why you've got the book. 15, well done if you've got 15 or more knowledgeable. 10, making progress. Uh, you've done all right if you've got 10. And if you've only got five, then, you know, it's... <clears throat> You're a work in progress, really. They're not quite, not quite there yet. You need to read the book. Now it says here, challenge. I said this last time. Make the contents of this quiz into a revision poster. I don't know how long you would have left of this lesson in order to do that, but you need to take it seriously and you need to own this topic. You need to realise that <clears throat> no one's going to learn it for you. I could stand in the classroom and three, four hours of lessons on these topics, even though we've already spent time working on them at home. Uh, and you might think, oh, that Mr. Reed needs to teach me these things. Well, we've, we've already done that. Uh, this quiz is another example of that. What you need to do is now spend the time with the book, with the material, actually trying to make sure it sticks. So you'll get as much out of this as you put in, basically. So I hope you take this challenge seriously. Maybe try and make a one-page poster that tries to link together the concepts of the raw materials, the... Uh, hazardous substances that are a part of the manufacture, the, the environmental impact of, of both digging up the materials and, and making them into the products and shipping them onto the user. And then once the, the device is in quotes, dead and no longer useful, the problems it causes while well, it sits there rotting. If it can, I, can I, a mobile phone rot? Well, it sits there in a big pile rusting away and just leaking chemicals into the earth. All of that process is, I'm not gonna call it a cycle. It only becomes a cycle if the tech is then um, used under the WEEE -E -E regulations and, and broken apart and its components then go back into the new manufacture of new products, that way it would become somewhat of a cycle then with less waste, but I don't think it is a cycle yet. So that's it. Um, please, as usual, um, when you're revising this, if there's something you're absolutely unsure about, Google it. Uh, you can ask for help on I Am Stuck. If it's some really specific fact about an organisation I'm unlikely to know, I'll, I'll just be uh, looking it up on the internet just like you would. Uh, so good luck with that revision and uh, also good luck in the tests that we'll be doing soon on this material.